Good evening, El Paso. Welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, where our mission is to share the fun of the big questions with you. My name is Dr. Kim Diaz, and I teach philosophy at El Paso Community College. And my name is Jules Simon. I'm a philosopher from UTEP, where I teach and write and practice philosophy. And today we feel very grateful to be interviewing our colleague, Mr. Joshua Villalobos. He is the Dean of the Mission El Paso campus. Dean Villalobos is trained as a geologist and earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in geological sciences from the University of Texas at El Paso. He was able to build the EPCC geoscience degree program from its beginnings, only one declared major to over 60 declared majors in seven years. As a result of this work, El Paso Community College is now one of approximately 30 two-year institutions awarding associate degrees in geology. Nationally and since 2011, the college has annually produced nearly 8% of all associate geology degrees in the country. His NSF-funded program, Solaris, Student Opportunities and Learning Advanced Research in the Geosciences, helped EPCC students interested in geosciences participate in research projects that were co-run by EPCC and UTEP geology faculty. In 2016, he was awarded the Geological Society of America Biggs Award for Excellence in Earth Science Teaching. In 2017, he was elected to serve as counselor at large for the National Association of Geoscience Teachers Executive Committee. And last but not least, in 2014, Dean Villalobos received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to start by asking you, what is the best thing about science? You know, what's the best thing about science? You know, I think anybody who gets into science is somebody who's looking for answers, whether it's in the natural world or in something that they're passionate about. And so for me, um, the best thing about science is uh, being able to get answers to the things that I see outside, So, which is predominantly the things that I've always seen as a child, the mountains, canyons, rocks, fossils. Um, it kind of satisfied that, that hunger or that thirst to kind of understand what are some of these ubiquitous things that we see all around us every day. So. Um, to me, that was my passion in kind of going into the realm of science. Okay, here comes a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a hard question at all. Um, well, you already gave us a, a bit of an indication of where you're going to go with this. You know, what's what's special about geology as a science? You know, why why do you why did you choose? geology as opposed to other sciences? For me personally, it has to do a lot growing up um, in El Paso. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm always telling people is if there's one thing that almost every El Pasoan um, shares every day is more than likely you look at the Franklin Mountains, either going to work or looking out your window, um, they're right there. And they have an absolutely incredible history um, if you know how to read them. And so for, for me to be able to understand that um, is something that I'm very passionate about. And you know, going to UTEP, um, having absolutely amazing instructors who are, who are able to kind of synthesize this incredible story that we have locally in terms of what these rocks are telling us was you know, just this formative experience in my life. And, you know, geology really is a language. It's a language to be able to read the story that's been captured inside a stone. And that's something that I think like when I would teach, the students would be like, oh my God, this I've, I've never realized, you know, you're making me look at things totally different. Whether they hated it or not, they, you know, they, they see that, that it's really, you know, the things that we take for granted have remarkable um, histories and backgrounds. Yeah, I think there's a, a relation there. Uh, I teach once in a while, I teach uh, environmental ethics or sustainability ethics, right? And so um, for a long time when we talked about history, we just meant the history of human intervention in other people's lives, right? History of wars or the history of civilizations. But it wasn't until um, 
I don't know, the last century, I guess, where natural history became, especially in, this cent in, in the 20th century, natural history became a way to think about, well, you know, how do humans fit into the natural world? You know, and then that has become a really critical issue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, we have this, you know, the youth today have this incredible understanding of how we impact our environment. Um, for geologists, you know, we have this ability to, to kind of look beyond the impacts uh, of humans because we're really looking at what we call deep time. So we're, mm -hmm. we're thinking about history going back, you know, hundreds of millions of years or thousands of millions of years, which would equate to billions of years. Um, and so what, what we see in terms of human impacts is such a small part of the overall history, but it's such a significant part of what we see today. So we're seeing sea levels rise faster than any other time in history. We're seeing pollution just rising. They're being recorded in the geological rocks now. I mean, we're, we're reframing our entire geological time scale just because humans are now here. Um, and like I said, we've been here for almost an infinitely small amount of time, yet we're having a major impact um, on the environment. And I think people today are starting to really come around to see that, yeah, we do have a major role um, on this planet, despite the fact we haven't been here very long. I would like to um, ask the next question, but before, before I do this, I would like to give a shout out to Dr. Julian, Betsy Julian, if you're yeah. watching. <laughs> um, I was her student um, many years ago, and um, and I know she was uh, one of your mentors. Formative mentor. I mean, just she was the one that um, made me switch majors um, from anthropology to geology because she was able to synthesize right this rather complex history of the earth and not only of the earth but local. And I think that's what really inspires people to understand where you come from not only as a species, but as a community of why we see the Sierra de Juarez where they are and why the Franklins look like this. And, you know, her lectures were phenomenal. I actually still have, so if she's watching, I still have my, my notes um, from her class um, inside my office. I, I was already a philosophy major, and she made me scratch my head because in the sense that what is the meaning of life seems to me like an important question, you know, <laughs> and for me as a philosopher, right? But she was always so enthusiastic about rocks and I didn't understand why any, and I probably still don't, you know, I, I really don't understand why rocks are so interesting. But it was clear to me that they are very interesting because, she, because of her enthusiasm as a teacher. And so I would like to ask all of that to preface this next question, right? What is the best thing about being a geologist? You know, I, I personally, I think the best thing is to see the world a little bit different than the average person, right? So you kind of understand your surroundings a little bit better. You can read the stories that are lying in the parking lot in someone's landscaping or the mountains that you go and visit. You have a better understanding of where they came from, why they're there. And I think it also puts your life into perspective in the sense that, you know, we've been here for four and a half billion years, this planet. Um, my role in my time is just the infinite little speck in terms of, you know, uh, what we're doing here. And so I've always liked that, that thought of, you know, where we fall in the geological timeline as individuals and being able to understand the world in a way that not everybody um, can. Doesn't mean they can't, but it's just kind of that little unique perspective. Our human drama. Is, yeah. It's is just right. the perspective. Yeah. Oh, and the, and the intensity of it. I mean, the next question has to do with the scientific method, but. Uh, I, actually, I want to follow up a little bit on what Kim was uh, Kim asked about being a ge geologist because um, I'm not a geologist. I, like Kim, I'm a philosopher, right? 
But I did get, I did, did get te to teach uh, humanities classes, and in teaching humanities classes, I always taught Darwin. Mm -hmm. And so Darwin, uh, in the middle of the 19th, beginning of the 19th century to the middle of the 19th century, that whole um, scientific community was coming to terms with, what's the Earth like? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and part of that was the new field of geology that was showing us about the dating of the Earth, and that, in fact, the Earth was not created in, in 1420 or 1120 at 9 o'clock in the or morning. Or 2022. <laughs> <laughs> right, 9 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. <laughs> but rather, it's been around a long time. Yeah, right? no, you so know. So that began to change everybody's perspective on what is this science stuff and what is this scientific method and all that. Yeah, uh, you know, it's this whole kind of revolution in terms of how the Earth works and the age of the Earth that really came out, you know, toward the end of the, the 17th century. And then as we get into the 18th century, you know, we really start to get this idea of what geology is. And it's a process that we refer to as uniformitarianism, where, you know, it's these small little gradual changes that over time give you these phenomenal features like the Grand Canyon. So you don't need a biblical flood to come in and wash away the, the, all the rocks and dirt in one catastrophic event. It's just these small little things that we see every day. Right, the streams moving and meandering and carrying away the dirt, um, and then you just give it 14 million years or 100 million years, and it's going to give you something tra um, dramatic. And it wasn't until really like the 1830s mm -hmm. um, when this kind of concept came out with the book The Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. Right. And yeah. it was picked up by Charles Darwin, right? And Charles right, right. Darwin gets this and he said, wow, this is exactly what I'm thinking. And that just gave him further support that it's these little tiny changes over an immense period of time that give you this final product. And it's really this a way that we started to change in our scientific thinking that things don't have to occur in an observable time frame. It can go a very, very long time, which we refer to as deep time in geology. Yeah, and I would refer to Lyle when I would be teaching Darwin. And the, and the, and the, the counter to uniformitarianism is catastrophism, which is, you mentioned that about the biblical, mm -hmm. biblical sort of um, events. <laughs> you Jules know. actually has a couple of fossils right next to his desk that he tells me it's so that I have perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, know, exactly right. Of my drama and my issues. Yeah, <laughs> yeah what's more long-lasting, right? Um, and then I do, I remember Dr. Julian's talking about geologists throwing around numbers, uh, years like peanuts is what she would say, yeah. right? And that reminds me in terms of math, in terms of time, like when we, stu when we study math, the infinity, whether you do infinity, um, not there, are they not the real numbers? What are they called? Imaginary? No, they're not the imaginary numbers. I forget what they're called. They might be imaginary numbers. I'm forgetting. When you do math logic, natural. I forget. Numbers, but like, yeah, numbers. in between, in between two, like the one and two, obviously, if you split them right, you can just go infinitely. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and then layers of infinity in between infinity. When, when I was studying math, mm. uh, math logic, that is like, wow, that is really cool. Anyway, deep time. So would you, how, how would you describe the scientific method for our audience? Well, my personal opinion for the scientific method, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of slice and dice what it really means. You know, you have something you would teach at grade schools versus something that you would expect to see in a university lab. But, you know, where the scientific method is really just a way of thinking. It's the way of, of trying to solve a problem by coming up with a hypothesis that, okay, this is what I think is going to happen or the reason why this is happening, and then going out there and looking for that evidence to support your theory. Um, but what I always told my students 
is that science is not so much about proving something's right, but really to prove something is wrong. Um, and you're looking to see, okay, what are the problems um, in my theory? I want to make sure that it is completely you know, sound and you throw everything at the book, at every arsenal you have to prove that it's wrong. And if you cannot prove it's wrong, then more than likely it's going to be um, correct. So I used to do this great because when we would go into um, historical geology, we would run into um, questions about the age of the earth, about evolution, um, things that people have a hard time conceptualizing. I mean, so one of the things that I would do in my class is I would um, go to the dollar store and I'd buy a puzzle, a box, it's a regular 100-piece puzzle. And on the puzzle box, I would tape it up so they couldn't see the picture with the big question mark. And so I say, okay, our problem in this class is figuring out what is the puzzle here. So I would go around and I would give everybody a handful of the puzzle pieces and I would break them up into small little groups, um, which would be members of the scientific community. And everyone had, you know, a, a handful of these puzzle pieces. And so based on that evidence, they would have to come up and say, okay, what's on that box, right? What's the picture we're looking for? And so they would say, oh, well, I see trees, I see um, mountains, I see sky. And so I would go up there and I'd be writing down all of the possibilities of what they can, what they can be. And so depending on the class and, and the time we had, sometimes we would have different groups talk to each other, just like in science, we have different communities talk to one another to try to support what they feel is the, the theory or what's on the box. Um, and so this would go on and th they would get all excited and they would try to figure it out. And, and what they didn't know was inside the box I had a handful of puzzle pieces that I never handed out. Mm -hmm. And so those represented the things that just aren't observed yet or science just has a limitation in finding those pieces out. Or God's sense of humor. Or God's sense of humor, right? So there's just something that you're not going to be able to see. And so we would go through this exercise and they would list all these things and we would finally say, okay, it's a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere during the fall because of the colors of the trees and we would get this great picture. Um, and then I would say, how many here would bet their entire grade that that is the answer? Even though I have this and I'll shake the box, there's a whole bunch of pieces that are still not there. And no one would say like, I'm not gonna bet my grade because I would say, well, for all you know, those pieces have a building or an airport terminal. Like I can be 99% sure it's a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere during the fall with a beautiful background of mountains, but I would never say 100% that that is what it is because I don't have those extra pieces. And that's pretty much what science is. I don't think no one would ever say definitively that this is exactly what is going on. So it's probability. Um, probability. A very high probability. Yeah, there's a very high probability that that's what's going on, but no one would ever say 100%. There's very few things in science that everybody would say that is exactly um, how it goes or that is the exact number that I would. I but the imp the I implication. Have a follow up question. Go ahead. But are you going to forget yours? No, I, I I won't. Okay, I have you know, and this is going to show like my ignorance. But how do you test in geology your theories when stuff is taking? I mean, this takes place over many many years. So like, if I have a theory, I'll die before I can test it. Yeah, it's not like you can put a rock in a petri dish. And I'm sorry. Yeah, that, yeah, great. You know? um, so I think we. Uh, so with uniformitarianism, right, so we know that things occur very slowly um, to give us massive, you know, consequences. Um, so we can test, okay, uh, if, the real, if the Grand Canyon was carved in less than 7 million years, how do I come up with 7 million years, right? So what's that number? Well, I can calculate how much sediment and rock is removed from a, a regular stream of the same composition, the same material over a one-year period. Um, and then I can calculate how much material was removed um, from the Grand Canyon, because some of the stuff is still there, so we can do a good estimate on that. Um, and then we can just forward calculate. If I know this much material is removed in a single year or in a single decade, then how many years do I need in order to remove the whole amount? And so that's where we can really use 
you know, math and chemistry and physics and all of these other sciences to kind of help us understand how these processes that do take a long time um, can occur uh, with a relatively good understanding of, you know, surety that, that that's what actually happened. Well, I have somewhat of a follow-up question here uh, on the scientific method and observation and uh, the way you described how um, geologists work and having to use uh, other sciences collaboratively or, you know, synthesizing in syn syn synthesizing ways in order to, you know, make your science work. So um, that comes in really handy in, in, say, environmental ethics because if you're saying that the um, topography should be such and such based upon how natural erosion patterns work, um, when you throw humans into the mix, you know, uh, if sediment is being washed away at a certain um, rate sans humans, without humans, you can say, you know, you know, based on our calculations, you, we're not going to have uh, a town here any, <laughs> any longer if humans keep, you know, producing this kind of uh, sediment runoff and, you know, clogging the streams and <clears throat> or produce, producing more runoff than, than usual. So I guess my question uh, has to do with um, the role of observation in all of that. So as a, as a geologist, do you find that that first step in, oh, I, I came back to the other question that I, I forgot. The first step in the scientific method is always observation, right? So connecting that step to how you understand the underlying long-term health of our terrain and, and the surface of the earth. What role, do, what role does the scientist play, it, the geologist play, um, in providing scientific knowledge, say, for something like environmental philosophy or environmental ethics? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, especially like for environmental justice as well. Um, and I think if we look at something, let's say, um, that encompasses all of that, would be like Hurricane Katrina. Um, so for years, you know, geologists knew the effect of what was happening with the Mississippi not being allowed to meander back and forth. Oh, right. Um, depositing all of that necessary sediment in order to build up the marshes and the swamps, which act like a sponge to these tidal surges, right? And so when you limit that, you exasperate, you make that issue bigger um, when it actually does come on board. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, we saw, you know, the disparity of how it hit people who, you know, were lower class and didn't have the opportunities to, to leave. And so that was a, a disaster that was well forecasted um, by geologists. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we see in, a, in observation and you know, knowing what's going to happen when it does occur. You know, that's one of the roles I think that's very important in geology is how do we present that information to the general public and not only to the general public but for those communities that are going to be impacted the most um, for things like, hurricane, uh, like hurricanes or earthquakes or landslides. Mm -hmm. um, those things that we know that are inevitable. Um, maybe not in the time frame that a lot of people are comfortable with or are going to act on, but they are inevitable. So the related question to that, I'm still on the observation point, right, of the scientific method. And you did tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got interested in geology, right? And so there's, uh, in science, there's something called pure science, and then there's applied science. So my, qu my first question about the environmental ethics ones has to do with applied, right? But then there's the pure science. So it, from a ge geologist's perspective, and maybe from your perspective, did you get interested in trying to understand the earth through geology for application reasons, or 
just because you like to look at rocks and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I, things I, like I think that. like right, right for anybody who's in that intro class um, that gets inspired because they're able to see, you know, you have your that educational eureka moment mm -hmm. where it's like, oh my goodness, I now I understand what. You know, this how mountains come about. Yeah, and I remember it so clearly, like when Dr. Julian had that single lecture to describe how the Franklin Mountains formed. And so these mountains that I had been familiar with my whole life, had hiked my whole life, now had that, you know, um, moment where I understood why they're there and why they're, the beds are tilting that way and why I find fossils there and not over here or over there. And it's just that, that purity of being able to understand something that you've seen your whole life um, at a level that most people you know, don't, don't have that luxury or that privilege. Um, to, to actually understand. Yeah, after that lecture, did you climb the Franklin Mountains and stand there and wait to feel the earth move under your feet? <laughs> um, I, I know, I know, right? Exactly. Um, I know, I know the driving back home, I completely yeah. saw them in a different light. So. Right. My Eureka That's moment great. wasn't like, like that. I was like, these are the questions I'm asking anyway. <laughs> you know, so I might as well. Yeah, no, I Study remember, philosophy. you know, the field trips that we would go on and she would just kind of elucidate on mountains that were 10 or 15 miles away and tell the whole story. I'm like, how can you do that being so far from them? But, you know, when you have that overall understanding of not only the local geology, but the regional geology, you know, it just changes your perspective um, in terms of what's around you and understanding what's around you. So that was just such a formative experience for me in college was to have that amazing instructor to kind of introduce that whole field to me. I have a follow-up question too to what we've been talking about. Um, truth is um, it's a very contentious issue in philosophy. For me the area of philosophy that I'm the most interested in is social political philosophy and because the truth has been used and abused <laughs> to um, by people in power as, as a geologist, would you say that scientists create or invent the truth? And I'm prefacing all of that with, you're estimating, right, that there's going to be a catastrophe, there's going to be a flood if the Mississippi is not allowed. So, you know, you're estimating this, um, these events and maybe People in power um, dismiss a geologist for their approximations instead of um, taking them more seriously, I don't, as, as I think could have happened. So what would you say as a geologist? Do you think that scientists invent or create truth? Um, I don't think anybody in science would say truth as a definitive. So if I'm saying something in terms of, let's say, um, a landslide that may occur in the Franklins. Um, it's inevitable. I'm not gonna sit here and say it's gonna happen at this time and this date, and I think sometimes um, people who may not have um, the way of thinking scientifically like a scientist or a geologist would do, they may interpret what we're stating as a truth that is not going to happen, but we never state it you know, I can say that it will happen inevitably, but you know, I can't say it's gonna happen next month or next year or this century or the following century or in the next thousand years because for me, mm -hmm. the, that amount of time is negligible. So for me, it's going to be instantaneous. It's going to be on a time scale that it's going to inevitably happen now. But for a person, a politician or the average person, if I say your house is right next to the Franklins with a pile of rocks that's about to fall down, my term about to fall down might mean anywhere between tomorrow or a thousand years. Um, in, in context of geology, it's going to happen really soon. <laughs> but for the average person, a thousand it's, years may not. It's like in Espanol when we say ahorita. Yeah, exactly, right? Ahorita. 
Yeah, it, it'll, it'll <laughs> happen. Don't, yeah, yeah it, <laughs> don't worry, it's going to happen. But I, I can't say definitively when. Um, I wish I could, but that's not science, right? Science isn't going to give you that definitive. I can tell you 99.9% .9 what's on that box, but I'm not going to definitively say that it is, you know, a, <laughs> a farmhouse in the middle of the forest. Uh, so. This is an important question. So we, we usually have a picture of scientists, you know, working alone in their lab and, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, perhaps out, you know, checking their measuring instruments in the field or something. So there's a lot of, I, there are, I think there are a lot of ideas circulating about um, you know, the, the individual scientist and the role that they play, like, you know, Darwin or Poincaré or um, Madame Curie or I don't know the names of famous geologists, I have to say. Which is one of our problems, right? Because <laughs> there are a lot of famous geologists, but they're just not on the tips of our tongues. Exactly. Not academically and names. socially, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big problem with geology as a whole is that, you know, we do have these incredibly famous people throughout history who have made monumental strides in our well, understanding. Well, there's Lyle, right? <laughs> right, there's Lyle, but I mean, that's definitely not on the tip of anyone's tongue other uh -huh. than you and I. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's that's something that, you know, w we need to, as a, as a field, um, act, start to change. We need to start promoting ourselves because for the average person um, on the street, what does a geologist look like? You know, well, that's a person with this graggly beard and a uh, oil pan, you know, gold pan on his back with a mule out there in, in the desert, but that's not, that's not the case, right? So a geologist is, has multiple fields. It's like saying you're a doctor. Well, are you, what kind of, are you a heart surgeon or brain surgeon? Are you, so there's so many fields that this one area kind of oversees, but most people don't realize how broad it is and how much it really covers. Yeah. So the question is, you know, is science an individual or a communal effort? In geology, do you, do you find that uh, most of the work gets done in a kind of communal research group sort of effort? Or do you, in your own experience, say, do you, you know, was a lot of your work done individually? Um, you know, I, I, I'm shifting the, the point a little bit from superstar geologists <laughs> to... I'm gonna say... Yeah, the yeah. kind of daily workings of geology, is it, is it, you know, how strong is the individual sort of effort versus the communal sort of well, I, I think of one of the things that really got me involved in geology is that it is a communal effort. You know, it, it's hard for you to come up with a definitive um, theory on something in geology without having it making it multidisciplinary. So you do need to collaborate with the physicists, with the mathematicians, with the biologists, you know, with your colleagues under the whole umbrella that geology covers to make sure that what you're proposing is a solid theory on something. I don't think any geologist works in a vacuum um, and not looking at other aspects and other science uh, sciences to try to prove um, any theory that they're trying to propose. Right. So philosophers that have achieved historical positions by getting ourselves killed, <laughs> <laughs> getting ourselves arrested and getting ourselves killed. There's several of us who have done that. I don't know if that's something geologists are willing to. Well, if you think about it, you know, <laughs> um, I always used to uh, half jokingly mention in my class is like, well, you know, volcanologists uh -huh. mm -hmm. have a very high death rate because, you know, they're, they're out there. They're studying those active volcanoes. They're breathing those poisonous gases. And sometimes they don't realize they're being completely engulfed in a poisonous gas because there's no taste, smell, um, or in, or color, and so they asphyxiate, or they're sitting on a volcano that all of a sudden explodes. So there's definitely, you know, some of us uh, who, you know, met yeah. their well, those fate. Those are great examples. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, but, like the guy to who achieved fame, right? <laughs> yeah, to, like the the person who recorded the explosion of Mount St. Helens. He knew he wasn't going to mm. make the the blast radius to a safe distance, so he just sat there and 
recorded and now we wow. have this uh, amazing footage of this <coughs> catastrophic event that occurred. That's incredible. That's like Socrates drinking hemlock. There you the, go, exactly, right? You know, for, <laughs> for posterity's sake. Do you think that geologists, is there a time, is there space and time in the geologist's day to think philosophically? When you start thinking about time, when you... I, I think that's all we do is think about time in geology, right? <laughs> so we're, that's, that's our, our best friend in geology is time because it's, that is what gives us the opportunity to see what we get to see in geology. Um, and I think, you know, most geologists probably allow themselves to uh, meander into that philosophical realm when thinking about deep time um, in terms of, you know, where we fit uh, as a species, as an individual, as a science. Um, when looking back at Earth's four and a half billion years, you know, still going to be here without us, without <laughs> our theories, things are still going to happen. Uh, so we can, I think it definitely allows us to, to think philosophically, and at least for me it does. And yes, that's, a, that's a good question, and I, I really liked your answer, Joshua. So, um, because if you think about it, you know, philosophers like us, you know, we deal with abstraction no. <laughs> and transcendence no. a lot. Let me finish. So, and, and so, you sitting there, um, you're dealing with rocks and this real material stuff, right? That just, there's no moving, there's no abstracting away from it in some ways, right? The rocks are right there, they're always gonna be there, the earth's gonna be there, this kind of material heaviness stuff, right? And so, the, for the two disciplines to come together, it seems like it would be a really healthy mix, you know? Philosophers should, you know, do more hands-on material sort of thinking. And we do have philosophers of science, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's a good thing that, that geologists do take time out of their day and reflect I think, on what's the yeah. meaning of, of their profession. And I think it, it's hard for you not to, especially when, again, you're dealing with such an incredible amount of time. I mean, you, your mind has to wander to that. So if, if you're on the Franklins and I'm looking at a rock that's 480 million years old and I see evidence of a hurricane, mm -hmm. right? That's clear as day in that, that individual rock layer. I mean, it does make you think like, oh wow, like 480 million years ago, El Paso was a shallow sea and then that day right there there was a hurricane, there was a storm deposit that interrupted, you know, this calm, shallow beach and, you know, what was it like? And, you know, are we ever gonna get to that point again sometime in the Earth's history where we're right back to being a shallow ocean and getting another hurricane, so. Yeah, I started thinking about in, in philosophy, there is what most, most humans adopt is what is called a substance metaphysics a substance view of reality where we favor what is as opposed to the transition between things. So um, anyway, I was thinking in terms of as a geologist studying rocks, you can see the change in the rock. So it is, it is a substantial rock obviously, but a lot longer has been in a process of change, just really slow. Um, so what is, it's just always becoming. Anyway, I was thinking about that um, in terms of, yeah, you know, a geologist studying what is the most substantial thing, which is rocks. Um, anyway, that and is. Well, I think with <laughs> like fossils, right? Mm -hmm. So Charles Darwin had, you know, it's beautifully illustrated inside the fossil record of change through time. So mm -hmm. I can go on the Franklins and, see a certain organism, let's say a coral, and see how it changes over tens of millions of years as the climate changes, as environments change, and it's beautifully illustrated um, inside the rock record. So we do have this wonderful kind of, you know, story to tell um, if you know the language. And so that's essentially, in my perspective, what geology is, right? It's just a language that we're trying to learn how to read. 
um, that's right there in front of our faces. That's a great answer because I want to I want to I want to um, pinpoint some things that you just raised by speaking the way you did, because. Um, Kim, Kim already asked, you know, do you have time in your day to philosophize, right? And so there's, you know, traditionally, popularly, philosophy is said to have come out of the phenomenon of wonder, right? And that's what you just described, you know, this wonderful process that we just have to learn the language to be able to describe that gives us this beauty, right? This aesthetic beauty. So telling the story of the evolution of you know, our topography and our planet Earth, you know, in, in, in ways that can get others inspired, you know, does take that kind of skill, you know, that skill to learning, learning how to read and then how to express and share that with others. The point I was getting at was the aesthetics part. Like, there's a real beauty in geology. Yeah, there, there really is, and it comes together beautifully. And so I've always told my students that this, I'm trying to teach you a language, right? And so for geology, every, any language starts off with an alphabet. And so for us, it's the periodic chart. And so those are the letters, right? And so you put those, those letters together um, to make compounds, which turn out to be minerals. Mm -hmm. And so this is me forming words. And then through the process of geology and understanding how minerals form and which ones come together, I can now get these words and I can start to now make sentences because those words can only come together during certain conditions. Mm. So minerals can only come together in certain conditions. So just like words, you can throw a whole bunch of words but they make no sense. Right. Um, but here I'm trying to show you these words coming together, making sense, and so that way now you can read a sentence. Mm -hmm. Once you get that understanding of the alphabet, of the words, how to put them together to make a sentence, now you can start to read full-on paragraphs and pages and then chapters and then books. And so that's pretty much, you know, how an intro geology course should be, mm -hmm. is your ability to understand how to read this language that is has books all over the place. I I would, that was pretty good. I would <laughs> I would like to follow up with our question is what is the what is the geologist attitude towards the fact that humans are fallible? And so I think, you know, in in the history of, of human thinking, I I've noticed, you know, in the time that I've been studying it, we humans prefer certainty over ambiguity and i think that is our our reason why we prefer what is substantial as opposed to what is in transition um yeah what do you say what would you say to that uh, as a way of answering science is giving us geology is giving us a story is giving us a way of understanding that is highly probable but not certain. And so given, given that and then given the human, I don't know, it seems to me like a deep disposition to want certainty. Well, you know, thinking of humans in geology and our effect on geology, um, we are new to the scene and will probably exit the scene relatively soon as well. Um, so in terms of geology will be a blip in the overall history of this planet. So the fact that we're fallible, we're making major mistakes right now, um, things that will be recorded in the geological time record, uh -huh. uh, you know, those are, you know, I guess there's a little bit of comfort in knowing that maybe future geologists would see what we're doing because we're preserving our mistakes inside the rock record. Um, and so maybe we'll learn a little bit more inside the future of how to avoid those things. Um, just like we see the things that occurred hundreds and millions of years ago. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, uh, 
we'll find a better way of, of living. Um, but well, speaking of being a to, blip, I let, me, to, let me... I <laughs> want to quote one of my favorite philosophers, Go John ahead. Dewey. John Dewey has this line, says, the live creature uh, makes friends even with its stupidities, meaning we learn from our mistakes, uh -huh. you know, so I hope that I hope that we're, we may or may not be a bleep, right? But I would hope that we learn, we keep learning from our mistakes instead of just killing ourselves. Yeah, you know, I, you know and that's where I, you know, my mind often goes to that place. Like, you know, where humans have been around, depending on how far you want to push it back, seven million years, if you push it all the way back, if you're thinking of, you know, you and I and what we look like now, what maybe a couple of hundred thousand years, mm -hmm. which for a geologist, is it even worth thinking about a couple of hundred thousand years? N no, will we make it another million? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's hard for, for us to kind of imagine. Um, so regardless of what we do to this planet, the planet will continue. It's been under even worse circumstances. It's been under even worse conditions, and it still has found a way. Um, whether we're going to help it or continue it down that path will be up to us. But either way, it's still going to continue. Yeah, I want to come back to the blip again and that, that how you're talking about it now, because um, gloom and doom. <coughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not gloom and doom, actually. So the whole point there is, uh, from a geo uh, geologist's perspective, um, you don't, you you may not have, if you hold that perspective really clearly and and you believe in it and and you've studied it and and you're aware of, you know, these millions and millions of years, time frames. Um, what is existential angst for you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, like, right? So there's really no really really reason to worry about <laughs> tomorrow there. Yeah, exactly. We're good, you know. <laughs> you know, this planet's going good right now. Yeah, right? that I guess, you know, there's the the current existential angst of, you know, where we are in climate change and how it's going to affect people less fortunate than us. And then we have the ability to make a change. Right. So in the short term, I think there is some existential angst for us as geologists in trying to get what we know to the general public so we can make some substantial changes. Um, not necessarily for you and I, but for the people who really get affected um, with you know, uh, lack of resources or rising sea levels, you know, those are going to be some serious issues and we as a discipline need to figure out how to get that done. Yeah, Long coastal, term wise, coastal, right, coastal co town dwellers. Yeah, I mean, those like are things that are going to have an immediate impact that we can help out with if we can disseminate our research and our understanding to the general public. Um, long term, Right, so then long term, there, you know, the existential angst really isn't there because I know regardless of what's going to happen, the Earth has undergone even worse conditions, right? We've been hotter climates, we've been, you know, in drier climates. Colder ones for sure. Colder ones for sure, right? And we got another roughly four billion years left of, you know, energy in the Earth for us to continue to go on. So, I mean, um, we're about halfway there, uh, so you know, maybe there will be some other intelligent <laughs> light that will evolve in this planet and, and do a better job than we did. And I think that's kind of where geologists can, can often let their minds go, like, okay, if we're middle-aged uh, middle right now on Earth, what's, gonna, what's it going to look like in the future? Who's going to be the dominant species? Who Are they going to think differently than us? Are they going to understand geology in a different way um, than we do? Are they going to be able to figure out what those last pieces inside the box are and have a better understanding of you know, their role in this planet than we did? So I mean... Um, I, I, had a st I, had a, I teach an ethics and science class to a group of students in what's called the MARC program at UTEP. So you might be familiar with it, but it's the Minority Access to Research Careers group. And uh, 
which is discontinuing because the, the person who is in charge of it, Keith Panel, who we interviewed last week, um, is, is retiring. <laughs> He's on his retirement trajectory. But I had one group of students, so we, we organize them in groups, and um, they do research projects, collaborative research projects from all different interdisciplinary science perspectives. And one group took up a project that um, explored the colonization of space and the universe. And their premise was that the Earth is doomed anyway. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're bound to get, you know, entropy is going to occur, you know, and, and it's going to slow down, and we, and, or we're going to have this, this cataclysmic war, you know, and, and we're going to have to find places off the planet, you know, because you just listen to scientists and they tell you this, this is not working. Right? Well, it's human nature, right? So, right. I mean. So, we have th so, they created this whole agenda, this whole, and they, they tied it in all with space exploration and the whole um, exploring Mars and the moon and moving beyond and the Hubble telescope and all these things like that. But it was based on the premise that the Earth was a doomed place to live. Well, I, I think that's all part of human evolution. I mean, humans, that's just our, our nature. We, we tend to make major strides when we're at the precipice of our own destruction. And that's where, you know, this is what's gotten us where we are today. I mean, um, I used to always relay this to my students. I mean, no one ever saves for retirement until like, oh, I'm gonna retire in five years. You know, that's just human nature. It's for us to really take action until we're right there at the cliff. Um, we're never really proactive. And you know, that's just a trait of our species. Um, now, we have the opportunity to, to make those changes um, early before we actually get to the cliff. But you know, um, hopefully as a species we'll do better and we'll start to realize that it's better to prepare before we get to that point but i think that we can i'm of the opinion that we can say this is what humans have done this is how they typically behave but i am putting my cards on the table i don't believe that there is such a thing as human nature okay uh, but that's for a different show but i still want to say you know i mean because because I think that I don't want to just be like, well, that's just human nature. <laughs> you know, that's just how it's going to go. I want to know what kind of relationship can a geologist have with politics um, so that good things happen? You know, I don't think it's just geology. I think science as a whole, um, you know, we speak a very unique language and it's just not geology. It's all the sciences. Um, and we have a hard time communicating uh, of what we see to a non-scientific um, way of thinking, or at least for a person. And so I think as a community, we need to find better ways to um, convey our information to politicians, to the general public, so that way they're more engaged in terms of what we know. Um, Sometimes, like, we'll see something, and I'll go back to Hurricane Katrina. It's like, well, we knew that for years. Um, and we told the politicians, we told the communities about it. But there was just something in terms of our conveying of that information that just never clicked. And, you know, we can kind of discuss, well, what, what did we say or what we didn't say? How did we communicate it? How can we be better at it? And I think that's where we are right now in science is we're having those discussions, like how do, we, how do we promote our knowledge better, right? Do we have a more diversified scientific field? Because when you're speaking to an underrepresented um, group of people, you know, having somebody not within that particular, um, you know, you don't tend to listen to somebody unless they look something like you. And so maybe we need to diversify scientists. Maybe we need to have better ways of communicating. You know, scientists don't take communication courses. You know, maybe as an undergrad, they took a speech course. Um, but, you know, we're not trained to convey information to the general public. We're trained to convey information to colleagues. 
and that's probably something we can do a better job at. Yeah. I, uh, uh, that's really good. So uh, it seems to me that besides those um, uh, strategic sorts of mm -hmm. considerations, it almost seems to me that scientists themselves, besides just conveying their information, it would be beneficial if scientists themselves got more politically involved. <laughs> yeah, you I, know, and, I, yeah. And that's a balance because if you're not going to be able to do your science, your scientific work, and be politically involved. But if you're not, if you just leave the politics to the uninformed or to the uninitiated, as it were, then we're going to end up with a lot of Hurricane Katrinas, <laughs> you yeah. know, basically. Yeah, it's a slippery slope, right? So, right. I mean, you don't want to be political because you don't want to jeopardize your funding. Um, yeah, there's a, that whole aspect. And, and you don't want to have people or fellow scientists think that, that question you're... Your, question yeah, question your, your motives, right? Mm -hmm. So why right. are you... That you're being political. Yeah, you're being political. And so I think that's, that's a very kind of tricky road to maneuver for, for any scientists. Um, and so, you know, and it goes back to my original kind of hypothesis that we really need to find better ways to communicate to the public. Because if the public knows, let them be the political ones. Let them do the voting and whatnot. Um, but if we can convey what we see, then they're more informed, um, and then they can make the decisions that we really want um, the general public to do. I also do. think, you know, um, stronger science classes earlier on so that people remember, right, because um, as people are getting their education through high school and learning the scientific method and how it works by trying to falsify, so falsify your hypotheses and just the basics of science, then that way the general public can understand this is where, this is where scientists are coming from. Instead of using, instead of politicizing science, um, scientists can speak their research, share their research, and then the public you know, make their decision. That's uh, an educational yeah. agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's the big challenge in terms of you know the sciences, because we know sciences are being gutted in K through 12. Mm -hmm. um, you know, geology is not taught, even in the state of Texas. I mean, we don't have any geology courses. It's maybe a topic in some science classes, but it's not something a high school student can take, like they can take chemistry, biology, right? And so, you know, and that's something that's occurring across the U.S. And so I think, you know, instead of being political to try to, as scientists, to try to beef up the, our, our K through 12 system and kind of, you know, have our colleagues think, well, we're being too political or maybe even je or, um, jeopardizing funding, it goes back to our ability to communicate to the general public. If the general public really understands what we're concerned about, then there will be the ones like, yeah, no, I want my kids to know about how the earth works. Let's put it back in school. Let's, you know, have curriculum built upon it. And it's just not a one or two day thing. It's something substantial. And I hopefully, that that happens, right? Um, where the number of environmental issues are on the rise and maybe people begin to realize that, hey, maybe we need to be a little bit more informed. So just like the environmental issue, right? Right, so. Well, well, you know, um, on that note, um, the need for better, be, being better in, informed and uh, an educational agenda, mm -hmm. right? You know, advancing the educational agenda differently. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dean Villalobos, and thank you to our production team. Thank you to our viewers. This has been Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. Please join us next time. We'll see you again soon.